Hello and welcome to Beginning, Middle, End, the podcast where we talk to creators and story lovers about storytelling. Acting has been a popular form of storytelling for over 4,000 years. Using one's body and voice to convey story didn't require written language. One of the greatest storytellers of all time was an upstart pro actor named William Shakespeare. I'm Shane, and stories are my favorite things in the world. Here to talk about it with me today is actor extraordinaire, Jennifer Riker. Jennifer has been a working actor for over 30 years. She holds an MFA from the Yale School of Drama. She's an acting teacher and coach. You've seen her on The Walking Dead, House of Cards, Nashville Castle, Criminal Minds, all over TV, audiobooks, commercials. Most recently, she's been the deliciously egomaniacal Dr. Jace on the DC Universe show Black Lightning. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Shane. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about story. You've been in so many stories. Do you what makes a good story? I think, I think what makes a good story is uh, believability. Um, a story where it takes you on a journey. Uh, a story where you live maybe vicariously through characters that you know, in our day to day lives, we don't, we don't even have. Uh, one third of the drama or conflict. And if we did, what would we do? How would we respond? So I love story also because I get to say things I normally would never get to confront somebody and say, um, that was the fun part of playing Dr. Jace, that the, the words in my mouth, uh, were just like you said, delicious. Um, so I think story is, is transformative and I think it's an escape. And I think that 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 reads false or kind of gross. We get put off if a story talks at us and doesn't evoke and doesn't let us go on the journey um, and forget our problems for a couple hours or a season if you're binging. Okay, so I ask this next question, tongue firmly in cheek, and I know it's reductive, but what makes a person want to spend their life pretending to be other people? You know, that that for me really just uh, it clicked for me as a little girl. So I, it didn't come to me later in life when I was even cognizant of it. If you had come to me now and I was new at acting, I might have a different answer. I just remember the power of walking on stage at seven as the little red hen and standing in front of the whole auditorium and bringing the entire mass to hysterics. I don't know if I embarrassed myself or did something wrong or the line was genuinely funny or it was just the way I landed the joke or whatever, but it was such a powerful uh, feeling that I did that. And then um, when they would stand up and applause, you know, I think I was, that's where my training began as a people pleaser, but I want more of that. And uh, I'm a recovering people pleaser now, but that's where that started was I want more of whatever that just was. So when I, when I walked off the stage into the wings, I thought, I just remember running to my parents with the flowers waiting for me. And I said, whatever just happened right now, I want more of it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Some kids might've been frightened, but for me, I knew that makeup and costumes and giddiness and laughter and all of it was just to me intoxicating. I think a lot of people have the automatic image of someone in t- uh, seeking attention as an actor, but I know you spoke uh, earlier about the catharsis of, of certain things, and I've heard Steve Martin talk about the introverted type performer that is in it because they get to express sides of themselves that maybe society represses. Do you have any, um, any of that that you get out of acting as well? Well, absolutely. And I think that's what I was saying about Dr. Jace, the, the, the sociopathic evil woman that, of course, she lives in me. I mean, I had to call something up. I mean, you know, they always say when, you know, you're playing or at least in my training, they said when you're playing a murderer, look, most of us don't have experience murdering, but we certainly know what it's like to want to get that mouse out of the house and go after it with all of that energy of, of must must destroy or, or the bee or the, or the whatever's in the house, you know, that rage to kill it. Um, and on some small level, that is what we're doing. We're recalling the moment I wanted to tell off the school bully in a calm way. See, the real Jennifer Riker would start to probably quiver in the voice and, and maybe want to cry, you know, I, I sometimes know when I... That. 
No, well, when I get angry, sometimes it doesn't come out as anger. It comes out as sadness and disappointment and frustration. And so I cry rarely when I'm angry. And that's the interesting thing about creating character. Um, it's so nuanced because in real life, I can, to play rage, it's not pure. So if we're looking at a, a primary colors, you need to find the shades in there because rage is disappointment, frustration, and anger. And it comes to a head, right? Joy is relief. It could be, it could be happiness. You have to find the colors in there, those striations that create the, the, because you just don't lump all happy, excited joy. These are all very nuanced, but different, you know, they're different kind of emotions. And so when you're, when you're playing these characters, you get to access that part of you that may be, like you said, repressed, um, but to be able to walk in the shoes of somebody who, who has no remorse, how many of us really get to do that? You talked about people that aren't murderers have things that they can draw on. So a character often appears in the script with the barest of descriptions, something like JB, a tough as nails, 30 something that smokes too much and laughs too little. How do you take that and then build a whole internal life story for your character? Well, first I would ask why. Why does she smoke so much? What is that vice about? If you want to get down to her real idiosyncrasies, what, well, where did that trauma come from that she had to rely on that as a, as a, a crutch? Um, smokes too much, you said, talks too little. Why? I would say why. And then I would find women in my past or that maybe perhaps mentored me or, or, or I admire and you borrow, you steal a little bit from these people in your life. There was a time when I would sit in the middle of, let's say the park, Central Park and just study people. And I would find the walk, the pace, the gait, the soundtrack that they walk to the beat, you know, all of that. I would say, what animal do they walk like? I would say, what, you know, what do they lead with their nose or their pelvis? And I would say that would be great for that character that I'm playing. You know, the fact that they walk really slow and make the world sort of come to them or they attack the world and they're aggressive and, and they have that sort of butterfly energy, that freneticness. And maybe that's why they smoke is to calm that down and, but also reading, all the answers are in the script. If it's well-written dialogue, it's in there and you have to just unpack it. And the more you read, the more you learn. If you're somebody that just flips through the script, how many lines do I have? You're missing out on some relationships that that's, that's your canvas. That's how you get to play. Uh, sure, sometimes you have to create the in-between stuff of the breakdown. But a lot of the time you can find it in the way the other characters speak about your character. So you may not be saying things, but if other people in the script are referring to you, that's information that I get to play with. And if you don't read the script over and over, you might miss that. And that's some, that's, that's where the good stuff is too. It's interesting that you talked about some of the external ways into character, like looking for the walk and the, the way people move. I think Lawrence Olivier famously said, if he could find the right nose, he could find the character. Um, I used to find, I used to have to say the character's name and then find her walk and her voice. And once I had sort of that in the body, then I would play with um, habits or gesticulations or energy. Um, but that's because I was, um, that's because I was exposed to that in the years of training that I've had. I will still go back to my favorite thing, and that's just observing, people watching. It's, it's marvelous. It's everything you need. So let's talk about some of your many characters. You've got a CV full of crime and action and gritty kind of shows that you've been on. In my opinion, you've played too few comedic characters because you've got some great mic drop lines of Black Lightning. What's the type of story you haven't been able to tell that you think you if I'm if I'm going to be honest here, uh, I, I really thought that was what my career would be, sitcom land. Um, that's what I fell in love with. I assumed uh, I was funny. I was always sort of a class clown. I fell in love with Carol Burnett and Vicki Lawrence, Mama's Family, and that uh, 
<clears throat> what Lucille Ball and, and Gilda Radner. I mean, I'm dating myself, but these are the these are the women that I worshipped, and I assumed I would do sketch comedy and find my way maybe to SNL, but certainly to do something like a variety show. I thought I would be, you know, Pratt Falls and slapstick, and I was a very physically comedic stage actor. And no, I didn't get to play that at all on 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 the little screen or the big screen. Uh, on Monk, I had a funny role uh, as a, an alien enthusiast. The joke there was though you first appeared to be very serious. And right, it's the reversal. Straight. Right, yeah. it's the reversal mm-hmm. joke. I mean, and and I remember in L.A., I studied with uh, with a teacher learning the eight characters of comedy, and I was rearing, you know, gearing up to do comedy work. And then I realized all I was booking were these crap kicking thinking man's woman. And I know why. I mean, if we're going to talk about typecasting, I have a deep voice. I have an angular face. I have a long neck. Uh, if I, if I am tall, if I don't, if I don't smile, I have uh, uh, an intense look. And the feedback I've gotten is, listen, you only get five seconds to make a first impression you know, so I know how to modify that when I walk in a room. I know how to make my face more approachable. But if, yeah, if you look at my resume, it's it's victims and it's it's white collar criminal. Um, listen, I think I've died six times on TV already. So it's a lot of lawyer, a lot of outspoken women, a lot of doctors and um, a lot of victims. Mm-hmm. But professional women, mostly, mostly white collar. Yeah, I, I would have loved to have been on uh, some Justified. I auditioned to play some white trash girl. I would have loved to have gotten my hands on that. But you see, they're not going to go with people who have a certain features because it rings false. And when they can get someone who really is, why would they stretch? Because there's not a lot of um, imagination in casting, I think. Yeah. There's just not. There's not time and there's no imagination to go, well, I bet if we put her in this, that, and the other. Now, once you're of status, like Charlize Theron, you can do monster, right? Because she's already proven herself. But when you're, you know, not a household name, um, you sell what you sell and you go to the bank with it. It's not like I'm going to be up in arms because I'm not getting sitcom mom like Patricia Heaton. What a great role. You know, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, what a great role. And those were those shows I, I imagined. Um, more to your question, though, I would love to, I would have loved to have done a, a period piece by now, something of another era. Um, Boardwalk Empire would have been tremendous. Um, uh, certainly, I would have loved the you know roles like The Crown. Um, Mad Men was terrific. I looked like my grandmother when I came out of costume, hair, and makeup. Um, I, I, and I love all of that. And there's a different clip to the way you talk in period pieces and I love costumes and I love, look, I'm an old soul. I think I'm from another era in a past life and that tickles me and I haven't gotten really to do it much. Let's talk a little bit more about that typecasting. Talk a little bit more about the limitations and maybe the strengths of being perceived a certain way as an actor. I guess the second part, you talked about having this idea that you're going to be in sitcoms. Was there a point where you accepted where your path or are you still trying to push back and go, uh, you know, different directions sometimes? No, cause comedy is incredibly hard. I just worry, uh, you know, I just, I just try to make certain dramatic lines have a little humor in them and I'll be funny on set and I'll lead my life in a, in a com- a comical way. And, and find the absurdity in my day. Um, frustrated, I'm sure I went through phases. Uh, I'm not in one right now. I, I just like to work. <laughs> I just like to work and, and, and be employed and tell a story um, and do it to the best I can. But first part of your question, typecasting, look, I, I haven't been an ingenue since I was 18, I think. I think even in college, I was always getting the older women roles. So I don't even ever recall going through, you know, playing Juliet and Romeo and Juliet. I really, I missed that whole phase because I was tall and had a deep voice. And so immediately I was the mother, the aunt, the, you know, the, 
the the school marm or whatever. And those are, don't get me wrong, I, I, and I love character roles. Those are the juicy roles. But the leading women. Um, so I am typecast, but am I going to complain? No, I'm not going to complain. Other actors might want to complain about that. Um, look, I'm not um, a minority actor. I certainly studied with minority actors and actresses. Um, who uh, were at their wits end and started writing their own content and getting into into ways where, you know, they would be producing the projects they wanted to be in and 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 like people like Mindy Kaling going, well, I'm just going to write, I'm going to write it then, you know, or um, Lena Dunham writing Girls and putting herself right there in the young lover ingenue, do you know what I'm saying? So I mm-hmm. I think that people swim against the stream with typecasting, but again, Hollywood has limit, limited time, time is money, limited uh, capacity to um, imagine. Uh, and I think that to have to talk, if a casting director has to talk a producer and a director into something and it doesn't work, it goes right back to the, this is why it doesn't work, see, kind of thing. I have friends actually who never did a love scene who are frustrated and say, I want to be the man. I want to be the love interest. I'm tired of being the best friend. But then I say work on it because I don't know if the industry is going to come around to you. So you come around to it and you find ways. And if it's doing a play or writing your own material, deal with it like that. But you are not going to change the industry, you know, that has been working this way for so many years. You've had a great career you've been working consistently for decades so you you probably have a great perspective on this i'm a history buff one of my favorite periods to study is the dawn of the studio system the transition from silent films to talkies in early hollywood it wasn't uncommon to have female writers and directors and producers in 1916 the highest paid director in hollywood was lois weber the highest paid screenwriter in the 1920s was francis marion women owned production companies but by the 1940s, all that had disappeared, and only recently have women been allowed back in charge of storytelling in the Hollywood system. So with your 30-plus year insight, have you been able to experience any of that shift? And if so, what does it bring? What does it bring? Yes, I have. I mean, I see more women directors now, and it was wonderful because on Black Lightning, uh, I might have had, I think, three or four of two seasons, I would have never had three or four women directors, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, not in my experience anyway. Um, but it did start happening in the 90s. There was, you know, there was just a lot more female directors when I would walk on set and first directors would be female and they were paying their dues to work up to being directors and casting directors are, I think they, they're female heavy, in my opinion. Uh, but they're also, that's a thankless job. If you ask a casting director, I'm sure they don't feel uh, as appreciated as they ought. Because I think they are magicians, just like the editors. They are the magicians behind the camera making these gorgeous performances. And the casting has to imagine it and the editors create it. So, you know, these are, these are roles that don't often get glorified. Well, it just reflects the world we're in. I mean, we've come we've come far, and we should, and we should continue to go far. And um, the younger generation doesn't see themselves as having any walls in their way. They don't know about old Hollywood and the men that that run the industry. Um, it's not on their radar. They all are equipped with cameras in their hands and stories to tell. And you know, there's not an intimidation factor. Uh, so I think that they're they're going to take take the industry by storm. At some point, there's going to be a change in, in, in power, a handover kind of thing. And I see women running studios. As an acting coach and a teacher, is there a difference? Do you feel any difference between what your students expect to be able to do in the industry now versus when you were a student? Well, yeah. I mean, my students are, look, when I was young, maybe I felt the same way. Like, you know, I was the big fish in high school. I'm the big fish in college and I want it now. And I'm not patient and I'm a victim to this industry. And I say, look, if you don't get used to it now, at the very start, you are a freshman in this. 
when you graduate college, you are bottom of the rung. You are bottom of the totem pole. And if you get impatient in year one, you won't have any longevity in this. You will burn out. You will be bitter. Um, but we told them that in college. If there's anything else you can do in this world, if there's anything else you are talented or love, go do that. This is the most unforgiving profession. And it's not one in which just because you pay your dues, you have to make it. You never have to make it. It's, it's one of the industries you, you can get a master's and, a, you know, and, and think you're climbing a ladder and never arrive. So you really have to love the industry. I teach the business of show business as well, because there's a lot of it they don't understand with actors' taxes, etiquette on the set. I mean, there's a whole other world that these actors kind of don't know about. And some of these programs are not equipping these kids. So they come out of college and they expect they're going to start auditioning and start booking. And extra work is beneath them. And I say, no, no, no. Learning on set, getting paid to learn. Being an extra is getting paid to learn. It's on the job training and it's networking. And this whole industry is predicated upon relationships. It's all relationships. So don't burn bridges when you're so new. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about dialogue. That's something many writers struggle with. On Black Lightning, you've had to talk about cellular matrix deficiencies, metahumans, Markovians. Carrie Fisher famously complained about some of the seemingly nonsensical dialogue she had to do in Star Wars. So a two-part question, how do you make lines like that sound authentic and what makes good dialogue? First part of your question, how do I make it sound authentic? Well, I get, you know, I have to really wrap my, my lips around those words, don't I? Uh, I don't know what they are. I go to the writer we talk about it. Um, spectroscopy uh, was a word that um, I think a couple of us flubbed on, and we just had to slow it down. And, and in some cases, ADR had to be done, um, you know, in post, they had to come back and record it over the lips and get it right. But um, if you don't know what it is and your character doesn't have that, you don't know the reason why the character is saying that, then it will always come out false. Um, it only looks silly if you don't commit to it. But if your character has a point to make, those words are just like saying in and the these are the words of my profession. Mitochondrial DNA research is something that my character in encounters daily. And so why shouldn't she say those words? Now, I've had to say things like um, phrases that were just corny, in my opinion, but I don't get a say. And maybe if I'm, you know, uh, an A-list -A actor, I get a say, but I'm certainly not going to say my opinion on, on, on set. I'm going to the writer standing right there. I might say to the writer, gee, would you tell me, you know, help me figure out the motivation for this, this particular piece of lexicon here? Like, why that? Um, or Markovia, what is that? Well, it's Eastern European. It's like Russia. Okay, all right. Now I know. Now I can put myself in that, in those people, uh, that environment, that climate, that culture. And how exciting. I've always wanted to play a, a, a you know, a, a, a Russian spy or something. Those roles seem very, just much more juicy. Seems like you were having a lot of fun on Black Lightning. Well, the thing is, I had to do two scenes in Russian. And this is, uh, this is one of the things I, I most upset. The whole experience was brilliant. But this, I spent weeks learning two scenes worth of Russian um, because my heritage is Latvian. Uh, my people come from Latvia um, and it was everything I had been wanting to do. And I got a coach and I got a, you know, uh, just for the language. And then I got a dialect coach and I had it down pat and my scene partner couldn't quite get there. And so they cut the whole two scenes <laughs> and I wanted it so bad on tape you know, just to, just to say, I finally played a, a, an evil Russian. And, uh, you know, now, now it's like I never booked it. I never did it. Uh, you know, it took away a, a, a fundamental part of who Jace is. That's a character that's got a lot of history and baggage behind it because of the, the comics, because of the extensive kind of 
sci-fi world that envelops it all. Was that hard to dive into? Did you have to get a lot yeah. of like, research on what it all meant? And yeah. How everything yeah, there were many together? conversations where I just said, what, I, I serum? Oh, so I'm really, really old? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Tobias had the serum too. Okay, so let me get this straight. And so I really I really had to, you know, with um, I needed a lot of hand holding when I first joined the cast in season two, and everything was well oiled. I had to learn a whole new language, as if I was in another country. Um, sci fi is nothing I had ever part- partaken in before, and it certainly um, wasn't in my repertoire. I didn't watch those kinds of shows. And so therefore I didn't understand the history of justice league and I didn't look at comic books. So I didn't know, um, relationships of characters from other shows, my impact on other characters. I didn't, I I didn't know who I'd be interacting with and I didn't know what my consequences were and the status, you know, to play power, to play a woman in high status, you, you know, to play that you have to know, what that status is with each character because your character knows what it is, but Jennifer doesn't know what it is. And so, yes, I needed a full education. And I did, I sat down with the writers and I said, start from the beginning. What is your favorite performance and why? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly in love with what I just did. I mean, it was, it was a, like I, you know, it was, it was a masterclass. I was working with such professionals and such such uh, legends, you know, in, term, in terms of directors, too. Um, I was working with people that had been in the industry for years. And just to be working opposite them gave me a whole new uh, experience when you're working with, uh, let's say leads of, of, of series, but it's their first time. It's their first lead, right? We all, we all have that newness to us, but, but pioneers in the industry, like Bill Duke, who've been around and James Remar, who've been around and working, you know, heartily in the seventies. And that was, that was, uh, that brought a whole new level of, of excitement for me. And I, I would have paid to be on that set with the amount of stuff that I, I accrued, all that information I amassed. I mean, it was, it, it was invaluable. What can I say? So, so for that reason, and you know, but, but I have to say there was a particular show I worked on and that I had never worn, worn blood packs. And that gives you such great to work with a squib gives you such great. Um, it's like a co-actor. I get to work off of it. I mean, it really propels you physically when it goes off. So it's not a make, not making pretend I feel something explode. It explodes on your body and through your costume and really, you know, jolts you. So because of that, I thought my performance, I really sold death on that one. So that was, that was brilliant. Yeah. We'll just, and we'll explain for everybody that doesn't know what a squid is. It's the, the blood pack with the little explosive in it that shoots out when, when uh, somebody remote detonates it. Well, uh, yeah. And Stephen Gyllenhaal, Jake's father, Jake and Maggie's father was the director. And he had gotten me a stunt double uh, to wear the dress with the same blood holes through them. And and I expressed, I don't know if I was supposed to, but I said, I, I'd really love to do my own stunts. I don't honestly understand why I have a stunt double. Well, because you're flinging yourself up a staircase. Yeah, I could do that, please. That's the fun. So she wasn't too happy with me, but at least I got to play the role in its entirety. And yes, I had bruises, but I would have done anything for that role and for him. There was blood everywhere. Um, but like I said, I think, I, I've died so many took, times. I think it took like three shots to finally uh, bring you down too. So it's like four and then one to the back of the head. But I really felt like I sold it. But like I said, having died five or six times, I was going to make a death reel of all my death scenes and then send it to like the sitcom casting directors and say, ugh, this industry is killing me. <laughs> you know, I was going to make some comedy out of it. But uh, now when I get a role, my parents, you know, first thing, are you going to survive? I am a uh, pop culture guy. I've been to Comic-Con many, many, many years, as well as other comic conventions. There's a whole culture around these comic book shows, the Arrowverse, Black Lightning. I know the pandemic hit... Uh, not too long after season 
three, was it season three or four, the pandemic hit? Yeah, I just did got you, killed off and then it hit. Yeah, did you get to experience any of that crazy fandom? Yes. I went to the Grand Rapids, Michigan Comic Con and I took my father because I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know if there were going to be fans of, of mine or the show. You know, I don't take that for granted up in Michigan. I don't know who's watching what. And I don't know what the what the um, crowd is going to be like. And I was next to Ross Marcand uh, from Walking Dead, you know, um, whose line was out the back of the warehouse door. I mean, he had so many signatures to sign and Vernon Wells was next to me and I had all these amazing actors around me. You know, I have to say what I took away from that experience was it was absolutely beautiful to bear witness to. It's not my world. It was thrilling to, to have people come up to me and be so excited to have a signature. Um, I went with the writer, the creator. So that was brilliant. And But the thing is, these people who showed up in costume were, were, were living their best life. And that was their best day. And they were among their best friends who sometimes maybe it's just at, at Comic-Con, they see each other, but, but that's their day. It's not my day. It's their day. It was their event. And I was there to make their day better, but they were having their day whether I showed up or not. And it was a beautiful event. And I was really moved. So I won't take up too much more of your time. I'm going to ask my last question, which is what is your best piece of storytelling advice? Oh, it has to be to tell the truth. If you're not, if you're not telling the tr your truth through the character, through the story, uh, it won't ring true. It won't land. Um, I think I said this in the beginning um, when we started talking. It's got to come from the heart because, like I said, people know when they're being lied to. When a story is disingenuous, it feels kind of gross to have to listen to something that's inauthentic. So I had a wonderful acting teacher uh, in college who said, just stop it, tell the truth. And then I'd start again and you can feel it's visceral. You can, you can, you, it's palpable. I should say you can, you can just hear it. You can, you can taste it. You can smell it with your senses, a story that's coming from a shared experience. And we are having this experience, this human experience together and you're living vicariously, and I'm leading you through it, and we're on this trip together. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me today. You can find Jennifer Riker's impressive list of credits on IMDb, Go Stream Black Lightning on Netflix, and if you want to find out more about her coaching, visit her website at jenniferriker.com. Thanks, Gene. You're still here? I didn't think you'd make it this far. Like, comment, subscribe.